Okay, thanks. Great, so I'll invite, um, first of all, the chair for the next session, Tim, to come up. Uh, we'll do a very swift um, name badge change. Tim, do you want to invite everyone else up? Or? Okay, um, yep. so first we've got Marcel, uh, Jamie, Lance, yeah. yeah. um, and uh, Maria. Welcome, all. Just um, setting up the name tags, um, I'll just introduce myself uh, and give a quick introduction to the, to the panelists if that's right, and you can add anything that I've missed off as we go along. Um, so, my name is Tim Brown, I'm from WaterAid. Sorry, <laughs> gotta be near the thing. Um, so, I'm from WaterAid, uh, and I'm also one of the co chairs of the UK Water Network. Um, and just to give a bit of background about how this event has come about. Um, essentially discussions within the UK Water Network, which is a group within the Bond NGO grouping in the UK, about um, issues that are overdue for discussion in the sector. Um, and this was an issue that bubbled up from those discussions and uh, we decided that it would be worthwhile trying to hold a, an event to, to air some of this. Um, and it was really um, driven forward by, um, particularly by Jonathan from um, Oxfam and Lucy Stevens from um, Practical Action. Uh, but with a lot of people from the network um, coming in uh, at different times and obviously with the support from ODI, which is much appreciated. Um, so um, with many thanks to Kevin for his rem remarks and Nat for his presentation, um, we'll start the discussion. Um, so we have um, Marielle Snell, is that pronounced correctly? <laughs> from um, IRC, who's uh, uh, expert on, with a background on uh, faecal sludge management. Um, and but working at the moment on CLTS uh, issues in uh, Africa, if I understand. Um, we have Jenny Lamb from Oxfam, who's a public health engineer um, and uh, focusing on capacity building, sanitation, and technical engineering advice in uh, the Horn, the East, and Central Africa. Is that right, still? <laughs> okay, you can correct. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, Mansour uh, is uh, working on a project relating to this issue, particularly in Ethiopia, I understand, um, on uh, sanitation marketing, looking to pilot the sanitation marketing program um, and create access to uh, sustainable latrines in uh, four populations um, and uh, works for um, IMC, right? Um, and so I've gone in the wrong order. This is Mansour. Alexi from um, Adam Smith Institute, um, and uh, the working on uh, a technical support unit of Adam Smith, um, working on projects for DFID and AusAid and the World Bank, um, including the Sierra Leone uh, National Water Supply um, and Sanitation Strategy. Um, so, um, and Nat, I, I, I think you've all uh, been introduced. <laughs> um, so, thanks again for your, to you all for coming. Um, as time, we have uh, very little time, so I'm going to try and keep things quite um, brief, and we'll try and um, generate issues for discussion and highlight the main concerns that you've um, either seen from these discussions or or arrived with. Um, so, I think if we can maybe. First, just to go along the along the the line in turn, um, and just ask you to pick out what you think um, the main um, problem that we should be addressing when it comes to um, sanitation markets uh, is for you from your experience, um, and if you've had any particular experience of issues going wrong with sanitation markets that are um, that are sal salutary for us all to to bear in mind. So I want to start with you, Mansell. So you have about two minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah thanks. Um, I work for International Medical Corporation, which is uh, basically a, a health uh, delivery charity. We mainly work in relief and partly in development. And I, this is my seventh or eighth week in IMC before I work with Vedic and, and Practical Action. Uh, but I think the, in terms of the, uh, the key questions, and I just used uh, use three minutes, but before before I um, before I do that, I think the the project we are doing in Ethiopia, 
Uh, there are some details on the table, and my, one of my colleagues, Kate Brogan, is here. Uh, so she is the project manager, and she is ha very happy to answer your question in more detail. I would just like to uh, <coughs> raise two, three uh, key questions. Um, and one of them is, uh, uh, do we really need to discuss more the role of, role of governments when we talk about markets? And if you Google, and if you pick up the, the key 20 or 30 documents written by, by well-known people, you see it is, it is in the introduction, it is in the headline, but then you don't find many contents. Uh, and why, why it is important? Because uh, we, we, I mean, as Kevin said and Ned said, uh, we are here talking also about rights and responsibilities, and I think we should not ignore that. Um, in any discussions on, on markets or, or, or whatever. But also we are talking about uh, seriously broken institutions when it comes to water and sanitation. If you are lucky, you may find a Ministry of uh, Sanitation in some countries, and you may also find Ministry of Water, but they may be just doing agriculture water. Um, they are not concerned with uh, slums or urban areas. So they, they, there, are, there is a serious gap not to discuss it, but also try to rebuild it. Because without rebuilding these institutions, uh, I don't think we can build uh, sustainable markets. Uh, so that's my first point, and that's, again, I hope we can, we can discuss it. Um, I think the, there are also a uh, number of issues um, in terms of the the expansion and, and demand, which are already covered, but again, again, we if we if you like to address some of the big gaps in, in sanitation uh, through market approaches, um, uh, the the role of uh, government, whether it's regulatory, whether it's it's control, whether it's pricing, uh, whatever it is, I think that's quite serious. So I stop here. I prepared a story, but probably in the next round I'll share with you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, thank you. So just just. Quickly, um, and this is easily done. So, so, um, so I don't work for Adam Smith Institute. I work for Adam Smith International. Oh, no, no problem. So I, I'm in no way responsible for the libertarian Sniff, agenda of killing, <laughs> killing the public sector at the moment. Um, but um, I guess that that kind of no, it's, it's no problem. It's easily done. Um, we've got to um, do better communications, I think. Um, but that kind of leads me to one of the issues is is about markets as as the as as the the golden uh, the, the silver bullet. Um, and I think in sanitation, um, I can talk about these examples in more detail. But one an example from Sierra Leone, which I think is is kind of generalizable is that sanitation as distinct from public health and as distinct from water is very much the orphan child um, and that's not something that markets and the private sector is going to deal with it's it's something that um, the the public sector the the ministries and the prioritization within government uh, it needs to take a lead on and civil society plays a big part in that so you know, that's one example where markets and private sector is not going to take a lead on that. Um, another example for, from Bangladesh, and this was kind of quick and dirty, but we're, we're, we're trying, well, a, a project I have been involved with is trying to promote public-private partnerships. And what we found is that every type of modeling, unless you use heroic assumptions, um, you know, public financing needs to be involved in service delivery. Even if the private sector takes on the the active delivery of it, it needs to be financed by by the public sector. There needs to be a role of cities investing in those partnerships. Um, and where private financing um, plays a part, it's often through subsidised financing. You know, World Bank financing and so on. Um, and then the the, the third the, the third area where kind of the public sector, another example where the public sector plays a big part is an example from, from Kenya, um, the guys behind Fresh Life, um, but this is just an example. The environment for sanitation enterprises to exist is really challenging for them. In Kenya, the public health policy environment um, is built in a way to pr protect you know, public health, but actually makes it very difficult for sanitation or uh, it, uh, sanitation enterprises to operate, um, and, and, and that's kind of something that sanitation enterprises often often say. So, um, so again, the role of the the public sector in um, 
in, is key there and, and moving towards an environment that is more enabling for the private sector to operate is key. Thanks. Um, I'm going to skip and come back to you now, if that's all right. Um, Jenny. Okay, so my name is Jenny Lamb and I'm with Oxfam. Um, I think maybe we'd like to draw us back to more the people-centred perspective. So I think as a practitioner, as an engineer with Oxfam, I think we need to spend more time on the vulnerability profiling, understanding the willingness to pay of communities. Um, the gentleman said about income, so really knowing the household, you know, economic analysis of that individual household, you know, how it changes in the season, how it changes in the year, who's got the power in terms of spending that money. So really getting more in-depth understanding at that at the community level. And then while doing that, I really could that the market maps, understanding you know, the market chain, okay, so who has the power, where is the integration amongst those players, so the customer and the supplier. Um, and also looking at the market environment, so you know, resilience in Bangladesh, the teams there really worked with what local materials are available, how they can make latrines flood proof, you know, so looking at you know, those entrepreneurial things from the community level, like how they build their house, okay, so how they build a latrine, for instance. Um, I think kind of building on what we've kind of mentioned a few times, fresh life, toilets. So I met with them in Nairobi uh, during the cluster meeting, during that markets meeting. They've done very well, but they have come to a plateau now in, in marketing the, you know, the fresh life toilet. So, so what next for them? I think in Nairobi, there's so many competing market actors there. That's part of the problem. So I think there needs to be more coherence and collaboration. You know, so you've got WhatsApp, you've got Pipu, you've got um, Sanergy, you've got Oxfam, you've got other agencies, um, you've got flying toilets, you've got the public toilets, you know, so if you're a customer, you know, who do you go to? So I think there needs to be more collaboration there. And it was interesting being at the Nairobi meeting, we had a lot of people with household toilets targeting Nairobi, but they're all doing different in initiatives. So in a, in a way, we need to bring that collaboration together more hand in hand. Um, I mean, in terms of experiences, you know, we've done on experiences through, you know, Who's your ally in the community? Is it community leader? Is it women's groups? So, you know, identifying those key players to really look at what's possible. Um, and I think, you know, drawing on the social enterprise models too as well. I mean, I think, Alex, you just mentioned about Sierra Leone. You know, we've tried to really work with looking at the pit emptiers, you know, before they were very stigmatised. So looking at how we can maybe help their performance, you know, so they don't need to go in their underpants into the pits and empty it, you know, having drank a lot of alcohol. They actually have you know, the tools and apparatus to do it in a more sustainable, you know, and dignified way. So I think there's lot, lots to play there about looking at safety and well-being of communities, but also what they can afford as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have uh, four points uh, to raise. Um, so I work at uh, IRC, and our focus has been very much on, uh, within the context of sanitation, how do we how do we work towards really creating services that last forever? Um, if any of you have got the chance to see our new IRC website, I would definitely suggest to, to, to go there so you get a better idea of, um, of our vision as IRC and also within the context of sanitation. Which brings me to my uh, four points. The first being one can't focus on sanitation without looking at the whole sanitation chain. And it was a point that Tim raised, and he had suggested, is it possible to that one or two of the links are missing? And what we have been uh, seeing, um, and based on our research, based on our observations and being in the field, is there's a need to look at the whole sanitation chain and not at simply at one aspect. The issue of leadership also seems to be a, a, a key issue that also comes to play when we start to look in the context of how, where does the private sector get involved? Uh, leadership for sanitation seems to still be lagging behind, whether this be within the role of which government uh, department is taking this role, and also within how does that balance within the uh, private sector. And the third issue is around public finance, or the lack of public finance around sanitation, which was mentioned in the introduction, and um, is something I hope will be uh, brought to light a bit more within this discussion as well. Uh, the discussion that we're having now on where the role of the private sector plays is a critical one, but it still also entails that we also look at where that balances within the role that the public sector plays, because that cannot be taken away. Um, and that brings me to my final point. In 2014, so only a year ago, we had a, a big uh, conference in Uganda, uh, maybe some of you were there or have heard of it, uh, called the unclogging the blockages of sanitation, where we were actually starting to speak more about these issues. 
Um, again, just as a reference for those interested, there was a Waterlines article that came out on this, uh, actually entitled Striking the Balance Between the Public and the Private Sector. And I think um, maybe when at the end of this uh, day there's a possibility of sending some material out, I think it, it would add food for thought because inevitably we can't discuss everything. Uh, but I, 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 the, the, the fundamental points that have been raised earlier and that I'm sure will be coming out uh, here on how do we find that optimal balance of uh, optimizing a match between demand and supply for sanitation goods and services, also under different circumstances, because no context is specifically the same, obviously. Thank you very much, and thank you everybody for being so good on time. Um, Nat, do you want to pick up on any of those comments in addition, uh, or add to your presentation? Um, I'll be very brief, because I've obviously had, had plenty of time to speak, but um, just this point about the need for public finance um, and getting the public finance right and explaining why public finance is still needed. Um, AMCAL did its uh, country status overviews quite a long time ago now, um, but 32 countries in sub-Saharan Africa and an in-depth look at financing needs and how much was going to the different sub-sectors. And um, what it found was that sanitation was predictably receiving very little finance either for hardware or for the software. And yet in a lot of the policies, in fact, the majority of the policies across these 32 countries, there was an assumption that things would happen through demand promotion, essentially, or promotion um, of markets and demand creation. Um, so there was this mismatch between the expectation that markets would establish themselves and the fact that government was just leaving it entirely for some kind of um, catalytic process to emerge from, from society and essentially uh, abandoning its responsibilities to inject finance to stimulate it in the first place. Um, and I think that's uh, really important as we think about um, the systemic things that are going to be needed to, to stimulate sanitation markets at scale. Uh, finance is absolutely critical. And uh, explaining to governments and helping governments think through how they can use public finance to stimulate those markets is, is essential, especially as Kevin alluded to, that the, um, uh, the kind of public investments in, in infrastructure that we saw in European countries just simply aren't going to happen because of fiscal deficits and a number of other competing priorities. Thank you very much. Um, so I think there was some, definitely some trends coming through from what people have already mentioned, particularly that we can't forget about public financing, even if it is going to be difficult to raise funds on some of those in, in some countries. Um, I think there's um, a bit of an qu open question about what really is the financing option for government spending in, in different contexts and whether there um, is more to be discussed there. Um, I'm re reminded of my colleague who's always reminding me that 90% of urban sanitation is public utility provided, so there's a kind of, you know, the people actually doing it for in the most part in those contexts are government or parastatal. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the importance of, the, of identifying the poor and, and, and uh, ensuring that markets don't cut people out or, um, or serve the needs of, 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 of the poor in the context of the whole sanitation chain is quite an interesting um, challenge, I think, that's come out of, um, you know, uh, uh, this, this conversation often bypassing, the, you know, the poorest and just thinking about those who can engage in markets. Um, I think we haven't really covered or, or raised specific issues around resilience. And so I want to see if anyone wants to come back in and say anything particularly about resilience, how it's uh, different from sustainability, I think, was one question and how um, what needs to be done differently with markets and it sounds like we have a hard enough time on normal in normal operating procedures with markets but, so with, when it comes to resilience what's different or what needs to be raised if anyone would like to uh, jump in or would, should I pick someone <laughs> Alexis maybe because you've been in Sierra Leone like. <laughs> um, well I think I think in terms of resilience um, one measures resilience in the times of emergencies, <coughs> in the ability for the different actors um, to to mobilise and, and and deal with the emergency. In the case of urban sanitation, we're ba we're looking at the the environmental sanitation issue. So, uh, if you take a, a, a flood, the the, the flooding, the, the 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 more rapid contamination of water sources with 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 black water. Um, uh, the, the, the fact that it's more difficult to 
uh, to reach water sources, the fact that um, the transport ways for people is, is more difficult. So um, uh, resilience is measured in the way that we're able to respond to emergencies. However, I think that resilience is built in preparedness, in the ability for the different actors who are working together, which involves the, the public sector, the regulators, the, uh, the parastatals, as well as the private sector involved at different points in the chain, to be able to deliver a system, deliver services that, is able, that are able to respond when emergency hits. Um, and there's one concept in resilience that comes from a completely different area, which is kind of ecosystem resilience. So the ability for uh, an ecosystem of, of animals and a food chain to be resilient to shocks is the idea of, of, of energy flows and the importance of a diversity in energy flows. So in ecosystems, um, th there's, there's, there's a significant amount of evidence that shows that when food chains are diverse and there are multiple ways that energy flows through food chains, when a shock hits, that food chain is more likely to be able to stay resilient and recover. Um, now, there's very little evidence that suggests that this applies in uh, energy flows or, or flows in markets, but I think it's an interesting concept to consider whether uh, an ability, uh, a diversity in delivery, so a variety of different actors, sanitation enterprises, public sector service provision, in areas where there are many different ways of delivering services, it may be more likely that when emergency hits, there are some actors that are de debilitated and, and aren't able to respond, but other actors are able to respond. And I think specifically the private sector sanitation enterprises might be better capable on a small scale to respond quickly when emergency hits compared to larger public sector mechanisms. So I think the concept of diversity in, uh, in stable periods might provide us an indication of whether in an emergency the, uh, the system of actors is able to respond. Thanks. I think that um, actually pushes, goes back a bit to something that Jenny was saying about um, the multiplicity of different actors in the, the sector as well. And I was sort of, um, I was thinking about your description of, you know, competing, all these different competing op options in, in uh, Nairobi. Um, I think when in a market, you know, there's competition, it's good, surely, you know, there's, is there, do we have a problem that we can't let things fail? Can't let, you know, if, if, if should they be, should the, the, the consumer be choosing in Nairobi and one or more of these organisations should be gradually going out of business or improving or, you know, developing and the grant, you know, role, the, the role of grants in perhaps having, creating kind of zombie social enterprises that ought to have actually failed perhaps. Yeah, no, I mean, point taken. I mean, competition is good. You know, like we choose between an Apple or a Samsung phone, for instance, yeah? So I think, I mean, when it comes to the collective with regard to sanitation, I think, I mean, it's it's reaching out to the customer, I think, yeah, and getting their preferred, preferred amenable, affordable option, I think. Um, but looking more at how we can maybe collaborate more at the the social enterprise models and things in terms of the recovery of the revenue but also income generating activities for the communities and seeing that value of that commodity for instance um i think as well you know within nairobi you know withstanding shocks there so for instance income yeah so income is quite seasonal you know given the amount of slum dwellers in nairobi fuel as well is an issue too as well so looking at you know the variabilities in fuel prices so the looking at you know all the inputs that make that service work you know how can it withstand a shock you know in terms of you know, inflation or fuel prices changing. So looking at those preparedness measures too as well. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so we're nearing the end of the allocated time. So I think if we can take a few questions from people in the room, and I, we do have people online as well. So I, I say specifically welcome to people who are watching online and do uh, type questions as well, and we'll include those in the discussion. Um, but does anyone have anything they wanted to add in, any additional comment or question? We've got about, uh, i say, four or five minutes. Hi, <clears throat> thanks. It's uh, Lucy from Lucy Stevens from Practical Action. Um, I have a question for the panel, but I think also something that would be great for us to reflect on during the day is about the extent to which markets will be able, well, the, the tension between market 
markets and promoting markets and sanitation, and at the same time trying to I achieve equity and a large-scale coverage. Because sometimes you might have a lot of competition of lots of different enterprises working in Nairobi, delivering different models of um, access to sanitation. But there might still be numbers of people within those contexts who don't have proper access to sanitation at all. Yeah. At the same time, lots of competition for the better off segments of the market of people who can afford to pay. So how do we deal with this question of equity and on the other hand, trying to achieve a wide scale coverage? I don't have the answer, so <laughs> I'd really be interested have, in we how we can come explore back to that, that at today. The end of the day and see if we've solved it. But, um. but I think in relation to that, Lucy, it's going back to that feasibility study at the very, very beginning to really mm -hmm. understand the profile of your community you're dealing with, to understand, you know, that profile of vulnerability essentially. So, like you're saying, the poorest of the poor. So, who, who you know, that those sort of social enterprise models, who are they actually really, really marketing? Have they really understood the in-depth affordability of that household? whether it's the women and men, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, difficult one. So I think it's actually bringing in some food security, livelihoods expertise, social enterprise expertise into, into the wash sector in terms of the markets, understanding, you know, that expendable income, for instance, and how they prioritise it as well across, across the year. In, in another context, but related to this, we're doing a study right now with the London School of Hygiene on wash and disabilities. And in a similar fashion, when we're looking at how do we link looking at... Uh, helping those who have a disability to get the right products, um, getting a very substantive baseline survey, understanding the, uh, the current uh, markets that are, that are there and how the sanitation markets can be linked to, this, um, uh, to uh, those who are disabled is, is, is key. So understanding the given situation uh, and the context is of, of prime importance before even reflecting on scaling up. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I, th I think uh, another way of thinking about this and uh, also touching on the resilience is uh, is to see in terms of uh, society and people um, and the system and governments. Uh, because when we do sanitation projects, uh, we have uh, our full attention on uh, physical products, uh, money and flows and all that. And that uh, take away our attention from, from really very important issue. And, and one, in one case, uh, it's, it's, it's entirely my failure, my mistake, that uh, uh, people in a market in a small town in Kenya, lots of examples from Kenya and Bangladesh comes on these meetings, but uh, one, <laughs> one small town in, in Kenya, and people were saying that uh, their main issue um, is, the, is the money which they pay for the stall, which, is that, which takes away 30% of their income. And my interest was uh, building a <coughs> sanitation block uh, for the market, which can where people can pay and use the toilet. So obviously, uh, in this case, I was not able to address the the real issue which was there because something which I was able to do <coughs> through a project. And I think I think if we if we want to really do something at a scale and sustainable and something which can last, then we really need to change uh, our own mindset of doing things. Um, and and, uh, and and better connected to to people, society, and and countries, um, rather than the the project uh, thinking. Which so I think that's a question again, which I would like people to 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 talk and challenge ourselves throughout the day. Um, we'll take one more because we're we're going to move on, but there'll be more opportunity. <laughs> Sorry, it's uh, Oliver Matthew from Even Products. We're a, a wash equipment supplier. Uh, centralised in eco, we already work with Oxfam and many other NGOs. We've talked a lot about private sector here, local social enterprises. What role do you think there is for centralised specialist equipment providers like ourselves to play, um, be it through distribution or assembly um, and communication? We've been work working on uh, access for those less abled recently, uh, listening to IRC, but we're not really getting the feedback like we are today because we're dealing with centralised procurement teams. So how can we improve access to talking to experts like yourselves? Um, does anyone want to pick this up? Or? Uh, yeah. well, I think we could, I'd really like to kind of push that back onto you because I, I've been in, 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 in towns where there are one or, sev cent one or several initiatives to expand um, latrine coverage and that the, the, there is certain designs and it, it's incredible how uh, you know not up to date they are and how they're not taking advantage of the latest innovations uh, whether they're high-tech or low-tech innovations and there's 
you know, you, you, you sit there and you're, you're in, you go to a, a meeting in London with, with lots of exciting technology and then you go to Nakuru or Kasumu and you just see that what's been pushed out is just really disappointing. Um, and, and, you know, in your head, you, you think about, you know, can we bring international suppliers to share information of, about their products to the government here? You know, what would that look like? A trade fair, what would it look like? But it doesn't seem to happen very much. And I guess donors don't like paying for trade fairs. Um, so I'd like to push it back and say, you know, as a, as a supplier based in London, you know, what would you like more in, in order to be able to, you know, bring what you offer to more people? You know, what, what would you expect donors and implementers to do so that this could happen? Um, just, just I think maybe we'll... I can just I can just pick up one thing really quickly is that um, obviously th three months I've been with Even Products and this has come at the perfect time to kind of take those conversations forward. We can probably talk in the tea break or whatever about what we're trying to do. I think additionally just to say it's, it's skill set training you could really do. So like yeah, we have had the ADEX e exhibition in Brussels, yeah? So bringing that expertise like the trade fair you're saying but also bringing, working with entrepreneurs in terms of building that skill set, you know, how did you come together with your sanitation modules, yeah? So bringing that to your Malawi, whatever, you know, in terms of finding where that niche is and where that market could be. Thanks. Um, I think we're going to have to close this session, um, but I have the thought. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give the last word to someone who's uh, on, commented online, uh, which is uh, Polly from Luwot, saying uh, they are sanitation in entrepreneurs working in the UK and Madagascar, and what we find is that toilet users do have willingness to pay we have research and field evidence to show this, but there is a lack of awareness of the costs of good FSM, both the capital and operating costs. Who pays for this at scale when the revenues available from customers may not be sufficient and government may not be willing to subsidise? Yeah. Um, I think that's probably something we can pick up further on through the day. Um, I'm going to have to call time. Um, thank you, everyone, so much for your contributions. Apologies for getting the name wrong. Okay. Okay. Sure. No worries. So we'll move the tea break to now, and then have to pick up the next thing, so everyone can have a quick uh, comfort break. Um, so. Uh,